My name is Kim Hardy. I'm currently I'm the section chair of GLASS at the College for Creative Studies in Detroit. Um, if the College of Creative Studies is something that you're interested in, please don't hesitate to come talk to me about it, ask questions. Um, I'd be happy to tell you more about the program there. Um, so I reformatted my presentation a little bit, um, really trying to think about the Playtime exhibition. I was really excited to be included in this exhibition, and it made me kind of think about and do a little research. Uh, you know, what, what is this idea of playtime? Why do we um, need or want play? What, what do we really think about that? And, you know, what I found in my reading is um, articles in Forbes that was like, yeah, you need play for innovation. You know, play is kind of the thing that'll kind of propel you uh, forward in your career, to think creatively, things like that. Um, and when I came to the exhibition and was kind of going around, seeing the different pieces, I sort of thought, you know, no, that's the opposite of what play is, is sort of like this tool to get you further um, along in your career or your ideas or whatever. Um, it's, it's sort of almost like a more uh, kind of inventive place, like kind of a spiritual place, a place where you can let go of technology and stress and just kind of, um, kind of free up your thoughts and ideas um, and not have to worry about the final result. So with that in mind, uh, I really put this talk together to really be about the process of glass making. Um, and this idea of playing with that process. So this is a piece um, from my senior thesis show at RISD, um, and it's one of my favorite pieces, and I, I like to start with it, because in this piece, it's called Scar Window, and this was the first time I started playing with the idea of craft as a performance, um, rather than simply a process to make an object. And, you know, we all know that feeling when you're driving, you go through, you know, you're driving and you see uh, the factory windows with the light coming through and they're all dusty and it's really this, this beautiful sensation. And I was asking myself, how could I kind of achieve that sincere kind of imperfection in a piece? How could I kind of get that sense of um, um, that something is like broken but still beautiful? So I created these scar windows, um, and what I did was I would blow large glass cylinders that had white color on the outside, and traditionally when you're making window glass, um, what you would do is make a cylinder and cut it and slump it flat. Um, however, the cylinders, before I was finished with them, I would kind of beat them up with all these metal tools that were in the studio, and so they were scarring and marking the skin of the glass. Um, but it wasn't this... Uh, kind of calculated act. It was very performative in the making. Um, and then that sort of became an attempt to capture this um, kind of sincere imperfection of the factory window. Um, so in my research about glass and performance, um, one of the places I've come to is um, the factory and the history of scientific management. So. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, obviously, all of these workers were going into factories, but not everything had been mechanized yet. And so there was a science created to try to mechanize people's bodies to be more efficient. And so there were all these studies made, and particularly in glass, um, that really, like, the ribbon light bulb machine wasn't even invented till 1922. So there was this pretty solid couple decades where it was just people blowing glass in the factory. Um, and so this is a time and motion study from um, 1952, and since we have some glass people here, you'll be able to read it. I'm going to use my laser pointer now. <laughs> oh, nope. Um, so these are pretty much two different models of doing production glass. So you can see on the top chart, um, the person will gather, marver, gather, marver, gather, marver, and at the end they end up making four pieces. On the bottom, they have two people working that gather one right after the other, and by the end they've been able to make six. So there are all these different ways to kind of chart and graph workers' movements through the studio. 
Um, and there were also these rules that they had to follow, um, or these principles for the most efficient type of work and most efficient type of motion. Um, and so this is kind of a diagram of how a worker's body would move in a space to place things more efficiently. And then you can see there are a couple rules written, and I'll read to you some of my favorites. Um, Here's a rule, both hands should not be idle at the same instant except during a rest period. Motions, motions of the arms should be in opposite and symmetrical directions of st instead of in the same direction and should be made simultaneously. And then my favorite, hesitation should be analyzed and studied and its cause accounted for and if possible eliminated. <laughs> So <laughs> these are the rules of, in, of industrial performance, but these are also still rules that, you know, we um, glassmakers kind of inter internalize and kind of live by in the glass studio, like eliminating hesitation. Um, this is a diagram, actually, of um, glass blowing in this notation called Le Bon notation. So has anyone ever heard of the B team before? The B team was a performance art and glass group in the 90s um, that were really exploring these ideas of performance in glass. And um, this is an excerpt from Glass Quarterly. They got together with someone who wrote Laba Notation. And Laba Notation is this really complex script that's more or less impossible to read, but it's a way to record dance choreography in a written form. Um, so every one of these squiggles and lines is describing the motion and direction of different parts of the body, the intensity, the speed. Um, except it's of glass blowing. So I've always been really fascinated by this diagram with this idea that if you could read this notation, that you could recreate an object um, just through knowing the movements. And that's something that's always really fascinated me because not only is glass very performative, um, much of learning to blow glass is built on this idea of imitation and how do you kind of capture this exact imitation of a person or of an object. And then the, you know, the idea of glass as a performance is complicated further by the fact that you're always in front of an audience. Um, you know, places like this museum, this is a, also a slide of Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center, are all, almost built as if they're theaters to bring people in and to understand the medium better. Um, so it's, fabulous way to educate people about the material um, and have them understand it, but it also can be a little bit of a conundrum for the artist who may be out there um, making a very small part of a piece or a very boring piece or um, any, any part of the whole range of things that go into art making, but yet there's expectation of entertainment or an expectation that something should be happening. And so the hot shop is a really interesting space for people to watch and to be watched. Um, it's really different than a different type of artist studio. So with that in mind, um, while I was at Wheaton, I started working on this sort of uh, corollary to the scar pieces, and these um, are called, um, this piece is called Hug Pile. So each of these pieces of blown glass were blown and then hugged while they were still hot. Um, and so I had a big silver suit on and um, all of this other stuff, but it kind of has that form that reflects the feeling of the gesture. So again, it's really the performance uh, of making that's kind of creating the feel and the gesture of the piece itself. Um, so this is another version of that piece that's made into lighting. Um, and so sometimes there's this interesting thing that happens on the hot shop floor. Um, this happened at Wheaton, where you're making this work, and there's a volunteer who's lovely and is trying to tell the audience what you're doing, and they just don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> they just don't know what to say. And so it's really interesting, um, you know, the miss, when those misunderstandings or miscommunications happen, where you get to examine um, what people's expectations are of what should be going on in the hot shop. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I, I went to grad school in a non-glass discipline. I went to grad school for art and technology studies. Um, I didn't have any access to glass. And suddenly I was in the studio all the time, but it wasn't a studio like this. It was just like a room with like a table in it, you know? And I started thinking about this idea of the studio and how, you know, 
throughout 20th century art history, there's this idea of the studio. It's like this blank space, this white room where anything can happen. Um, and here I have a slide of Bruce Nauman whose idea was, well, if you're an artist and you're in the studio, then whatever you're doing is art. So here he's tracing the line around the perimeter of a square. This is from 1967. Um, and in one way, he's making that point. I'm walking around the perimeter of a squ square. I'm an artist in the studio, and so that's art. Um, and so that's such a contrast to the hot shop, where you go in, and there's so many things telling you what to do. Um, there's your bench and your glory hole, and it's all facing a certain direction, and the kiln and the pipe cooler and your assistant and your tools, that even before you get started, there's this kind of limitation on the spectrum of what's possible, of what's going to unfold. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that inspired the piece I'm making today, but also throughout all my work, is this idea of questioning the space of the hot shop and crossing and making a hybrid of these ideas between you know, the hot shop and this idealized version of the studio. Um, so I mentioned the B team earlier. You know, I also wanted to mention that there is this kind of unwritten history of performance in glass that's really exciting. That's something I, I'm really excited about. Um, I'm really interested in alternative histories of studio glass. Um, you all are glass makers, so or not glass makers, but you're all in Toledo, so you're aware of glass. <laughs> this is something I know about people here. Um, and there's this narrative um, that's very centered on objects, it's very centered on um, this one trajectory of artists um, who've gone into specific galleries and been collected, and um, people think that's what studio glass is. But there are all these other things happening in the 60s and you know, throughout um, where people were creating performances. So these are a couple examples from um, the Glass Performance Film and Video F Festival that I, Film and Video Festival that I helped curate. Um, where you have Hank Adams um, in the corner who has a very performative process. His work is not performance per se, but he's hot casting all of these different pods that are hooked together that he has to do very systematically to roll up and anneal at the same time without them um, kind of losing form. Um, on the bottom right, there's Fred Call, the great Fredini, um, who did a glass circus, uh, I think, in the early 90s at Urban Glass. And uh, at this time, in this particular video, you'll see people like Kiki Smith hanging out and watching, which is very cool. Um, and of course, the B team, um, the most well-known and probably arguably the most successful glass performance group, um, and their piece, Spontaneous Combustion, that actually won a performance award in New York when they did it. So there's. And this, this particular video festival had, you know, 20 to 30 examples of people throughout the last 50 years who've been working in this way um, in that history. Um, so within this idea of performance, um, there is, of course, the body and addressing the body and how the body moves through space. Um, so this was just a piece I made, kind of a study in 2008 at, P at Pilchuck Glass School, where I just put LED lights on all my joints and tried to make a cup and tried to see what that looked like. Um, so again, thinking about this idea of imitation and perfection and tracking movement through space. Um, and then in my research, I found this scientist um, named Frank Gilbreth, who did time and motion studies just this way to uh, to try to create more efficient systems, whether it was drilling a hole in something or sorting papers. He made these elaborate studies where he would attach lights to people's hands and then figure out how to cut out um, motion and make it more efficient. Um, Frank Gilbreth, what I sort of like about his story is that he kind of had this altruistic purpose in mind, which was to make the worker's life easier, um, whereas most industrial science at that time was to make the worker work faster so that the capitalist could like gain more money from production. Um, but he sort of saw this as a way to um, alleviate some of the workers' burden from, from their tasks. Um, so I created a performance called um, The One Best Way to Do Work. This was done at Brooklyn Glass. And the two ideas that I felt were really in tension for me was on the one hand, there's this idea of art making, capital A art making. Um, and you know, even Harvey Littleton said, I think I have a quote here, 
um, to divide what should be a single unbroken act of artistry into a series of functions is to destroy it. Okay, so this idea that art making should sort of be this transcendent gesture all at once to create something. Um, versus what we're up against in the glass studio when we're working, which is like um, efficiency, uh, perfection, process, breaking steps down, um, and really having to work that way um, because, you know, you're paying for time and you're paying back your assistant and there are all these things kind of pushing you forward. So I thought that those two ideas, this idea that we should make art in the glass studio and yet the glass studio is really telling us that we have to work super efficiently were, was really intention. Um, and so I created this performance um, where I have a performer here on the bottom right, who you'll see a little more of this later, is kind of moving around the space um, in this kind of irregular fashion um, while I'm creating this glass mountain, I'm kind of mimicking her, but on the other hand, in this very like regimented um, kind, of, kind of pace of gathering um, and, and flinging glass everywhere. And so as this is going on, um, there's an audio track um, where you're hearing me read a paper called um, The Fourth Dimension of Measuring Skill. And so it's pretty much a paper written by Frank Gilbreth that says why it's so important to measure skill, record it, and pass it down to future generations. And that you, know, you can create this super skill if you can just capture people's skill. Um, and then there was a projection of the Harvey Littleton quote I just mentioned, which was to, to divide what should be a single unbroken act into a series of steps is to destroy it. Um, so it was looking at the tension between those two things. Um, so along with these light drawings, I was really interested, again, in exploring the relationship between glass and the body. And of course, the vessel is always this really beautiful metaphor for the body, and even the way we speak about vessels having lips and necks and stems and feet is very much analogous to, to the body. And so I created, I went, um, I, have, I have this book called Old Venetian Glass, and so I wanted to recreate all the pieces of glass um, in this LED light form. So on the one hand, I'm thinking about my own body in proportion to the piece to kind of understand how it's made. But on the other hand, I'm kind of trying, again, to do this impossible task of achieving perfection and replicating something perfectly, which, you know, um, by its very nature can't be done. So these are slow exposure fit pictures. I think they're about 20 seconds long. Um, and I did that for, I think it was all 72 plates in the book and then created a large, um, a large digital print of those plates. Um, and so in thinking about that idea, I was like, well, you know, I've made all these different pieces, but if I really wanted to be good at something, I would need to recreate the same piece to see if I could like achieve this per perfection, um, if I could really achieve, you know, being an expert at creating a certain form. Um, so I did a print of, I guess this is, 90 Veronese pieces where I recreate it over and over and over in this kind of attempt um, to create this perfect form. Um, so I, um, over spring break in March, um, I went to uh, Ghent, Belgium, to the D Design Museum Ghent, um, where they were having an exhibition called Lightopia that was about lighting, both historical and contemporary. Um, if you get a chance to see it or see the catalog, it's a really, really amazing exhibition um, with all different kinds of really beautiful lighting. Um, and so we set up a hot shop in the courtyard to again do a performance. Um, and this performance was called Revolutionary Light. Um, and so it has some of the themes that I've talked about already, um, but also thinking about this idea of transmitting kind of heat to energy um, glass and light and looking at that connection. So here you can see I've created a slow, <laughs> slow exposure picture of a light bulb um, that was projected large on the side of the museum. And the light bulb became really the theme throughout the entire performance. Um, so here um, I'm working with a partner and we're doing what I like to call synchro blow, synchronized glass blowing, where we're creating all of these light bulbs to be used later in the performance. And so again, kind of playing with this idea that if you could do the exact same thing at the exact same time, 
um, you can make the exact same piece. So we're kind of in this factory mode of creating light bulbs. Um, from there, we created a large copper grid. Um, and when you drop uh, glass on a copper grid, hot glass conducts electricity, which is actually very cool because cold glass is like a really intense insulator that will absolutely not conduct heat or electricity. Um, and so we would drop the hot glass on the grid, um, which would light up different light bulbs that people were holding. And so their light would go on, and then before we could almost get the next piece of glass onto the grid, it would slowly start to dim as the glass would cool. And then another one would go on, and another one would go on. So again, thinking about this, this kind of idea of this transference of heat into light and glass into light. Um, from there, um, we did a piece where we were taking Prince Rupert's drops and cracking them into these buckets of water so that the light underneath would sort of uh, diffuse and illuminate and kind of thinking about light then transforming into a mode of communication, right? Um, when you're sending an email, it's all these just ones and zeros blinking at the end of a fiber optic cable um, and that kind of struggle and that remoteness of communication um, using technology. And from there, pulled some, some very long fiber optic cords across the studio um, the, in a just very kind of repetitive process that were then illuminated uh, at the end of the performance. Um, so as you can probably see, this idea of um, optics is something that's really important to me. I often find myself um, experimenting just with the way that light and glass work together. Um, and glass is this amazing optical material. There's all these different phenomena, phenomena that occur. Um, and so one of those phenomena is um, uh, the phenomena of the water lens. So these are just um, water lenses, a really, really simple form, spherical form. Um, and when they're filled with water, this is a little bit of a light slide, um, it'll project the image from behind it in front of it. So you can sort of see here, I don't know if you can see here, that the person standing behind it, their face is reflected a bunch of times across that screen. So in this installation, you would walk into the gallery, you would come around this wall, and you're kind of confronted with all these objects. You know, of course, you're at an art show, and you should be, you may, may expect to be looking at objects. I mean, you kind of have this opportunity to examine them, and then when you come around, the other side, you see everybody else that's examining them. And so you have this voyeuristic moment, um, which was sometimes very hilarious, um, of what people do when they look at art. And of course, they don't know that they're being watched. Um, and the art itself is actually the mechanism that's allowing you to watch them. Um, this is kind of some more you know, light experiments that I've worked with. Um, this is a piece called Mapping the Petticoat. Um, and this is a the inside of a wedding dress that's just been kind of set out as if it were uh, like a landscape model. And what happens when you project a grid of light onto this material is that it goes through the netting multiple times and kind of illuminates the topography of all the different folds. And so what happens is this thing that's very kind of domestic and um, talks about femininity then becomes this like, kind of sublime landscape. Um, and you know, what you'll see from the piece I'm making is that this idea of, of the Spliman landscape is something that I always kind of return to in my work as an interest. Um, and so I think this dichotomy um, is something, the dichotomy of materials, they can have these multiple meanings is also something that um, I'm interested in. This is just a, a detail. Um, so this is just another version of that piece. It's about 12 feet long. And then um, ultimately, I wanted to kind of address the body with this piece. And so I made this very large suit made of tulle, this tulle fabric, where I was able to actually move around in a space, um, creating these sort of landscape forms uh, through performance. And that was ultimately kind of the most successful iteration of the piece. Um, so again, um, this is actually a piece that I started here at the museum, so you may recognize the curved wall. Um, 
In 2012, I came here for uh, the uh, Toledo Workshop Revisited Residency. Uh, 2012 was the 50th anniversary of the beginning of American Studio Glass, which started here in Toledo. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of my talk um, when I kind of talk about the piece I'm doing. But uh, one of the things I started doing while I was here was you know, taking all the detritus that we were all making in the glass studio. One of the reasons I did that is because all I was making was a lot of trash for the first part of the residency, so I really didn't have that much to work with. Um, but, you know, I, I was thinking about particularly this space is like so pristine. It's like so clean and shiny and beautiful, and um, yet there's all of this stuff like constantly being discarded in the glass studio. Um, and so I was curious about playing with that. Um, and kind of the expectations of what you see in the glass pavilion um, in a glass museum. And so here I'm just projecting light on it, you know, kind of like I had done with the tool and just saying, like, what will this do? Um, you know, what's going to happen here? And what transpired um, was this body of work where I started, um, or I sort of had this new material vocabulary. So I was looking at these. Uh, kind of discarded ruins of artwork. In this case, it's architectural glass from Chicago. Um, but then when light is projected on it, it kind of transforms from being this pile of trash <laughs> uh, to a landscape that kind of reflects uh, this video into this like cosmic projection on the wall. And so then there are a couple pieces I'd like to talk about that are sort of outliers. Um, but I'm interested in them. Um, this is a piece I just created for a show in Chicago called Scaped. Um, and this piece is called Spill. And essentially, uh, it's an immersive piece that's just a really giant glass spill that stretches out kind of all over the gallery in different spaces and corners. Um, and it's this kind of, it's made with baking soda. It's this kind of soapy glass um, that has all these bubbles kind of everywhere. You know, this piece, again, I'm kind of looking at imperfection as, uh, as like an opportunity uh, to experience beauty. But I also feel like when I started working at CCS, I needed to make a piece where I took as much glass out of the furnace as I could. And so this was sort of cathartic <laughs> in that respect. <laughs> and so this is just another detail shot of it stretching through the gallery. Um, and so this is a piece called Scar Prints. This, uh, I feel like, is perhaps a big outlier in my work, but it's actually one of my favorite things that I've made. Um, and what it is, is prints of people's scars. Um, so uh, it was kind of a community-oriented piece. I started it at Pilchuck Glass School and have done it in other spaces in Chicago, where I invite people to come. Uh, I take a print of their scar, and then I give them a print. Um, and they kind of mark down what happened and where. Um, and they kind of look like these interesting topographical landscapes. They're very abstract. You don't know what they are, but then you're kind of able uh, to read these both descriptive and totally non-descriptive um, descript descriptions of them. And I kind of am interested in this idea of layering. There's this time and place on the body that a scar is. It's an index of this really specific thing that happened. But it doesn't look like that thing at all. Um, but there's this idea that you know, a time and place can be layered onto your body in a different time and place. And I was really fascinated by that and this kind of idea of collecting them. Um, so this is an installation of, I think, about 60 scars um, from people that I talked to. And it's a piece that I'd like to continue doing. I feel like it's ever expanding this library, um, library of scars. OK, um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the piece that I'm working on um, at the museum. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I came here for a residency in 2012, the Toledo Workshop Revisited Residency. Uh, and so what we did. Um, you know, my proposal for this residency was to try to capture liveness in glass. I didn't really know what that meant, but um, this idea that glass is literally a frozen record um, of something in motion, I was very, very interested in. Um, as I mentioned, what I was also very interested in kind of eliminating um, all of this architecture of the hot shop and working simply with the furnace. Um, 
this was great because one of the things that we did at this residency was we actually rebuilt um, the furnace uh, that Harvey Littleton had used in 1962 for the original workshop. So we used those plans to create our furnace, and that's the furnace that I'm using outside right now. Um, so Harvey Littleton, who knows about Harvey Littleton? All right, so I'll try not to bore you like too much with this, um, but this is like something I'm maybe a little obsessed with. Um, so Harvey Littleton um, is known as the father of American studio glass. So, um, you know, when people started making glass art with a capital A, um, they say he kind of originated that here in Toledo. So people have always been making art objects with glass, but when they said, okay, no, this is, this is real serious fine art, capital A art, um, Harvey Littleton was teaching ceramics at the University of Madison, and he came to Toledo and he um, taught a workshop where glass um, was in the artist's studio rather than in the factory. And so this was a really big critical moment and has kind of spawned this whole community of glass artists and institutions like Toledo Museum of Art Glass Pavilion and many others that are, that are now um, really thriving today. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, along with this interest, and as I mentioned, this interest in alternative histories of studio glass, um, I read Harvey Littleton's book that he wrote in 1971 called Glass Blowing, A Search for Form. And almost nobody has read this book. And the reason why is if you look at the pictures, it is like the most horrible kind of glass blowing images you could ever see. It's like the gathers are off center, the bubbles, it's like crude, you know? It's like, you know, why would you want to read this <laughs> if you were trying to become a glass blower? You know, these skills were surpassed, you know, many years ago. But the thing about the book is that it's not really about glass blowing at all. And in fact, the, he had to be convinced to put that in the title. It's really a book about art making. Um, and these sort of ideals of art making. And it's really beautiful to read because you see that Harvey Littleton's ambition um, was not to become a glass blower, but was to kind of integrate glass as a material into um, a studio art practice. So it's all, it's a little esoteric. I mean, I think those lines are very blurred. And yet, when you read it, you realize that, you know, there wasn't any real kind of commercial ambitions. There weren't really any kind of production ambitions, design ambitions. It was really about this kind of altruistic attempt to make art. Um, so that was one, you know, really important reference point. And I think along with that, in thinking about this altruistic attempt to make art, I was thinking about the artist's studio and the sort of fantasy of the artist's studio, you know, and Jackson Pollock, these images of Jackson Pollock are the perfect example where he's kind of in this, you know, trance-like state in this cabin in the woods making these paintings. Um, and thinking about how those paintings became so important because it was not about the imagery, but this idea that it was an amalgamation of experience. And in many ways, the paintings themselves are a really important embodiment of this artist ideal, of this kind of like macho man in the woods flinging, flinging paint. Something about that imagery is actually, I think, the, the evocative imagery that comes with a painting, and I think that that's kind of really interesting. So I came here, as I mentioned, and as I mentioned, I made a lot of trash at this residency. I was really just dripping glass a lot everywhere. I dripped it everywhere. Nothing happened, you know, I was kind of like nervous, um, you know, I'm just like making all these drips of glass, I, they don't look like anything, I don't know if this was a good idea to get rid of all these tools. Um, but what ended up happening was eventually I kind of found this collection of glass stringers that were by the furnace. Um, I was like, okay, well that's interesting, why don't I drip some glass on that too? And then suddenly this architecture started to unfold, this form started to unfold sort of before my eyes and I was able to build it up really, really quickly. So this, this piece was made almost in the course of an afternoon where it was like there was nothing and then there was something and then suddenly I had like stumbled onto this process um, just through this intuitive kind of process of making and you know one thing that was really 
that I really loved. And I think Bill actually came up to me and he was like, you know, that's exactly what the glass looks like when it comes out of our fiberglass machine. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, of course, the glass itself was chemically formulated to be fiberglass. And so, you know, to kind of come across this way of making where the glass is doing precisely what it was formulated to do was really, really rewarding. Um, so this is an image of the piece in the wall there. And so, you know, obviously this form evokes kind of a com complex landscape, but it also evokes these different dichotomies that glass has, um, that it's both kind of very strong but very delicate, it's very organic but very rigid, um, and it's kind of, you know, liquid and solid at the same time. It's kind of captured in these, these gestures of falling towards the ground. Um, and so since I've made that piece, you know, I've had a couple opportunities, in, you know, including this one, which I'm very grateful for, to try to make this, this work again. Uh, the work is not very demanding on the studio, but very demanding on the space, because I'm standing right in front of the furnace, and it unfolds over the course of a couple days, um, which kind of limits who's around you, you know, what can be done around you. Um, so I was able to make this piece, this is about 10 feet long, at the Chrysler Museum of Art, um, as part of a two-day performance uh, there. And I was thinking about sh shipping this piece. This piece I had shipped, the foundation that sponsored the residency kept the piece, and we were able to successfully like, get it into storage in Baltimore. And this I wanted to try to bring back to Chicago, but I knew that it was gonna degrade a little bit. It, it won't break, it's not like it breaks in half, but every time you move it, it kind of shifts and kind of crackles. Um, and so I was thinking a lot about that, and I thought, well, you know, that's really kind of maybe really apt to the work. So I created um, this document, this certificate of transience that kind of accompanies the piece um, that says, you know, as you have, if you have it, when you move it, it'll change slightly. And over the course of its entire life, it may change a lot, but that that's kind of um, the nature of the work itself. I'll be working on another one of these glass mountain pieces um, out behind the museum. This is probably four times the scale of anything that I've worked on before. Um, it's a really amazing opportunity to really kind of push scale and process and also have an opportunity to interact with um, people um, who are able to come and watch. So I'm really you know, pleased to be doing that here at the Toledo Museum of Art. And um, yeah, I think that kind of wraps it up.